Today we're going to preach out of Mark 3. We're going through the entire book of Mark over the next handful of weeks. And, and the, the title of the sermon series is called Holy Dust. The idea of we want to be people who follow Jesus so closely that the dust from his sandals washes right up on us. We want to be following the ways of Jesus so closely. And in the passage we have today, we're going to hear a really cool example of, of Jesus just exemplifying his character, and there's a lot to learn. So here in Mark chapter 3, it says this. It says, Another time Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal them on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? But they all remained silent. He looked around at them in anger, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, and he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and the hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. So out of the gate, this story feels a lot like a story about the Sabbath, which it is. But I think there's a great deal for us to see and learn about the character of Jesus as well as it applies to the Sabbath and many other things. And so here we're going to learn so much about the character of Jesus. And if we're going to be people that, 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 uh, that, that, that are in the holy dust following Jesus so closely, we want to really de- dig deep and unpack everything that this story has to offer. But I think in order to fully understand it, we really need to learn a little bit about the Sabbath and what it really is. So we're going to take a little 10-minute theology course on the Sabbath. Does that sound good? So one of my favorite definitions of the Sabbath is that the Sabbath is the rhythm of God. It's part of the rhythm of God. We, we see how God works in a particular rhythm, and we see this obviously in the story of Genesis. When God was creating the earth, he worked for six days, he called it good, and then he set aside a seventh day. And this was kind of the rhythm through which we see God work. He works for six days and then he puts one aside and he works for six days and he puts one aside. It's it's kind of the heartbeat through which God works. Now we, as people of God, are made in his image, right? And so this heartbeat, this rhythm that beats inside of God is is the same rhythm that beats inside of us. And so for us to live to our fullest potential, it would behoove us to live within that same rhythm as we are made in the image of God who exemplifies that rhythm. Does that make sense? So six days and take a rest. Now, we have a choice not to follow that rhythm, but I'll tell you, it doesn't work out very well. Hello. And... um, it It just doesn't work out very well to not follow that rhythm. And so... In this rhythm, we will find a lot of health and healing in our lives. Now, what's interesting is in this rhythm, God didn't just set aside the seventh day and and call it a day off. He actually called it holy. He called the seventh day, Josh, our resident Hebrew scholar here, he would know this. God actually talked, took aside the seventh day and he called it Kadesh, which means holy. And the seventh day is the first thing that God called holy in all the scriptures. Isn't that interesting? It wasn't a person he called holy first. It wasn't a place he called holy. It wasn't a sanctuary or a tabernacle. It was actually time. A particular set of time is what God actually called holy first in the scripture. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that, I think that's really interesting. It wasn't a cathedral, a temple, a person. It was time. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel says this. He says, Sabbaths are our great cathedrals. Sabbaths are our great cathedrals. They are a sacred time. They are a time for something sacred to exist 
within in the same way we often look at a monastery or a cathedral, a particular holy place as sacred. The first thing God called sacred in that way was the seventh day. Does this make sense? It's a holy set aside time. Now, when I think of sacred places, everybody say sacred places. When I think of sacred places, there's really kind of three things that come up in, in my mind when I think about them. Three things that happen in a sacred place. First is worship and prayer happens in sacred places, right? We connect with God, we worship God, there is prayer that in, in any sacred place, worship and prayer happens. That makes sense, doesn't it? The second thing that I think happens and that is always present in a sacred place is rest and rejuvenation. I often don't find that um, places that aren't restful usually don't feel very sacred to me. Healing is what happens in sacred places. You, you're, you get rest, you're rejuvenated, you get healed. So healing and rest and rejuvenation is what happens in a true sacred place. Lastly, communion happens in sacred places. Now I think that obviously applies to like the Eucharist and actually taking communion, but also Communion with one another, with our friends and family. Meals happen, celebrations, birthday parties. In sacred places, people share life with one another. They live well. And I, I love the idea, especially of meals. Coming to a literal table and celebrating with your friends and family. In sacred places, communion happens. I think we experience this so often. The ability to come here no matter what you've done or no matter who you are. And to come here and feel like you're part of a family that you're welcomed here in this place. I experience communion every week, man. When I'm serving in the, in the gym and 200 people come in for a warm breakfast, maybe their only warm breakfast of the week, like that feels like communion to me. The Ragamuffin Cafe is a sacred place, right? And so, there's, so it's worth noting that when, when, when we consider this special sacred time, this sacred place that God calls the Sabbath, there's two things that really stick out to me. For one is that it's, it's simple. That a sacred place isn't very complicated. You rest, you get rejuvenated, you have communion with one another, you worship and pray. It's, it, it's, it's really not that complicated. To, to, to be in a sacred place. But, but secondly is I think it's also uniquely diverse. It's simple and, let, and yet it's really creative. For example, when you think about rest and rejuvenation, there's some of you here, <coughs> Carrie, who think that hiking up a mountain is somehow restful and rejuvenating and healing to you. Right, or putting on some shorts and running for miles and miles, somehow you think that's restful and rejuvenating to you, and I don't know how that works. But, but for me, that is absolutely not the case. In fact, that is literal hell on earth for me, right? But, but for me, on Friday, I sat and I read an, almost an entire Star Wars book on Friday. And for me, that was restful and rejuvenating. Lord knows I didn't walk one whole block on my Sabbath day. But the truth is, is it's not more holy for me than it is for Carrie. There's diverse, creative, unique ways through which God created us to enter into rest and to take in the Sabbath, the rest and rejuvenation. Same could go for prayer. We all pray in a myriad of beautiful and diverse and unique ways. So it's, it's, it's simple. There's worship and prayer and rest, but it's also diverse. We can engage in, in all three of these things in really different and beautiful ways, and, and that's okay. Now, Jesus himself, he learned about the Sabbath through something called the Torah. Everybody say Torah. Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible, and it's really this, the story of God. And so this is where Jesus would have first learned about this rhythm of God. He would have read in Genesis. He would have memorized and been able to quote this entire story at the beginning of Genesis about this rhythm of God. And he would have seen that God called the seventh day holy. And so that's what Jesus would have worked to exemplify in the rhythms of his life. Taking a separate day to call it holy and have a, a set-aside part of time to rest and rejuvenate and pray and be in communion. But as Jesus grew up learning this, 
so did a movement of Pharisees and religious zealots. And they took this law of God that was given to the people of God that said um, that had all of these various kind of rules that would help them live a holy and liberated life. But what the what the Pharisees and religious zealots did is they took the law of God, the law that God had given the people, and they perverted it. They distorted it. They took the law of God and then they added to it. And they added more, and they added more, and they added more. So, like, this is kind of what that looks like. The, the Torah has about 615 laws in it. The Mishnah, which is the, it was an audible tradition that over a few hundred years, the religious zealots had continued to, to um, progress, right? The Mishnah had 1,500 laws in it. So, 615 to 1,500 um, and some uh, 39 of those laws had to do with how to keep the Sabbath in the way in which they thought was best, okay? So they had 39 very specific things that they said, this is exactly what you must do in order to observe the Sabbath. Things like you can't untie knots on the Sabbath or you can't blow out a candle on the Sabbath. Some, some things like this. And so... Here in this story, Jesus is like here on the Sabbath, and he's in this sanctuary, and there's this guy that needs healing, and these religious zealots are sitting there, and they're thinking, okay, like, is he going to heal this guy on the Sabbath? Now, here's Jesus sitting in this room of Pharisees. I kind of like, like, let's just imagine it for a second, right? Here he is, and there's this guy, and he's kind of reading the minds of the other folks in the room, and he starts hearing them sort of like gossiping and jibber-jabbering in their their minds, right? And they're like, is he going to heal on the Sabbath? Is he going to do it? Is he going to do this? And And then Jesus thinks about Rabbi Herschel, you know, saying the Sabbath is like the great sanctuary, a holy place for healing and rejuvenation. Of course Jesus is going to heal on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a holy place. It's a sacred place. This time of day is holy. It's a place for healing. Of course he was going to heal on the Sabbath. It's a sanctuary. What else is going to happen in a sanctuary if healing isn't going to happen on a sanctuary? Of course. I can just imagine Jesus just laughing. He's like, of course. We're not in a sanctuary because we're in the synagogue. We're in a sanctuary because it's the Sabbath day. It's a holy time. Does this make sense? Of course he is going to do that. So when Jesus decides to heal the man with the shriveled up hand, he was absolutely breaking the Mishnah, the rules that the Pharisees had made up. But in no way was he disobeying the Torah. So we can learn two really important things right here. First of all is Jesus loved the law that came from God. He wasn't against it. He loved the law that came from God. What Jesus hated was the versions of the law that was taken by religious zealots and made more complicated than they need to be. Jesus loved the law from God. He hated the law that was taken and made to be oppressive and restrictive. He loved the law of God. What he hated was the law that put other people on the outside. That, that, that struck the poor and the, and the misfortunate away. So Jesus said, yes, I love the law, and I'm going to observe the Sabbath, and I'm going to heal this guy on it, and I'm going to do away with, with all of these oppre- oppress- oppressive laws that the, that the religious zealots had made. And secondly, we see that the law, Jesus shows us through his example, the law was never meant to constrict or hold someone back. But rather, the law is a foundation and a platform for freedom, healing, and liberation. So if the law that you hold on to, that you find to be really sacred, is, is, is putting people into bondage and not liberation and freedom, then it's no law of God. Jesus, when he heals this guy, he's really making a statement to all the Pharisees in the room. He's saying, you serve the law, but I came to serve the sick and the marginalized and the poor. 
You may be so obsessed with these rules and regulations, but I'm obsessed with love. This is what he was saying when he chose to heal on the Sabbath. I know you, you are worship these laws, you religious zealots, but, but I am about love and healing and hope because this is a sacred place and this is where healing happens. Now, this is where I think there's a little bit extra for us to learn here in this message. This might get a little spicy for a minute. But I think part of what this passage does is it shows us what people with the religious spirit look like. And it's a warning to us, to, to those of us who may fall into a trap. And as I, and as I go into this, I want you to know that, that I, part of what I'm about to share is, is things that I've seen in my own life, okay? That I am guilty of this as much as anybody else that I am a recovering Pharisee and still relapse often, okay? Um, but it's really worth noting, I think, we, because we know how Jesus feels about the Pharisees, when we read about them and we think about them in the scriptures, we often consider that they are like people that were really different, major outcasts, they are the big evil ones wearing little devil horns and like they were just really easy to spot. But but I think the truth of the matter is, the Pharisees were religious people. They were people that went to church on Sundays. They were the people that went to pursuit on Wednesdays. They were people that went to noon prayer. As a matter of fact, I think we, the people in this room, were much more likely to look like the Pharisees of that day than we weren't. They were the people that, that, that took part in lots of religious things. So it's easy to perceive them as outcasts, but really they looked like a lot of Christians look today. They were lovers of politics. They were lovers of power and money. They were lovers of the law and draped it all in the name of Jesus. Something that we all are guilty of. Lovers of politics, but draped in Jesus. Lovers of money, but draped in Jesus. We are a lot more likely to look like the Pharisees than we would ever want to admit. And this scripture really shows us and is a warning where Jesus is saying, listen, I want you guys to see what this looks like. And so here's just a couple things that, that maybe could, could be helpful for us to consider. Do I have this religious spirit in my heart? Do you wish that people in your church or community looked more like you? Do you walk in and say, well, if they just prayed like I prayed, <laughs> if they just voted like I voted, if they just dressed like I dress, do you go in wishing they looked more like you? It's the mark of what a Pharisee could, could look like. Are you quick to see the bad in every person and situation? around you? Is that the first thing? Are you looking for what's bad? You see here, the Pharisees were in this room, and there was a man that need heal, healing. And they were quick to say, is Jesus going to heal on the Sabbath? What they completely missed was the person in front of them that needed healing. But they were so quick to look to accuse. They were so quick to look to judge. They were so quick to say, man, I don't like the way this is. I don't like how he observes the Sabbath. They were so obsessed with the law that they didn't see the beauty that was right in front of them. They didn't see the opportunity for healing to happen. Are you quick to see what's wrong in a situation, what's wrong in a person, what's wrong in the room instead of being quick to see what needs healed, who needs love, who needs to be taken care of? Do you dismiss people's feelings, circumstances, and humanity in the name of being factual, in the name of being right, in the name of being law-abiding? Say, man, oh, the, the, the law says, the facts say it must be like this. But they missed the human being that was right in front of them with the shriveled hand. They were so obsessed with the law, they missed the feelings and the humanity of the person right in front of them. Are you quick to criticize? Are you looking for reasons to accuse others of not following the law in the way you see it? The scripture says that they were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. Is your first instinct to try and have your finger out, ready to accuse someone? I'm not saying, well, they don't read the scriptures like I do. 
Are the issues more important than the people? The law is not about constriction and holding people down. It is about liberation. It is about hope and freedom. And so, like I said, it's a little spicy, but but the hope is that we can be liberated too from this. That I can be liberated of my Pharisee like ways and see the people in front of me before I obsess over my idolatry to the law. So this is what Jesus was communicating in this room through healing on the Sabbath. But the way in which he healed on the Sabbath also communicates something really deep that I just love so much. You see, it's really interesting. Why, in this moment, did Jesus have the man stretch out his hand like that? Well, he was referencing something from the Torah, something that he deeply loved and knew. He knew about the Sabbath and everything that it was about. So why did Jesus have this man reach out his hand? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12, it says this, Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Here's the good part. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So what does the Sabbath teach us? It teaches us that when, we're, when we are oppressed, be it by a Pharisee-like heart, whether we're sick and we need healing, it's not, it's not about working our way out of it, but it's about reaching our arm out to the redeeming God who wants to heal us and restore us. You see, he says, remember you were slaves in Egypt. Well, what were they slaves to? They were slaves to their work. What they did in Egypt, they worked and they worked and they worked. That was their punishment. They were slaves to their work. How many of us, to many degrees, are slaves to work? And there's two ways that we're really slaves to our work. Okay, for one, it's, 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 it's when work is so infused in our identity. Henry Nouwen says, you know, the three worst lies that, that we say to ourselves is, I am what I have, I am what I do, and I am what other people say about me. And so much of our identity is based on the work, right? I'm going to do this work so people say that I'm good and cool and I've got a great job. I am what I have because I made a lot of money. I am what other people say about me because I've got this sexy job. So when, when are we become slaves to our work, God is saying, reach out your hands. So when we Sabbath, what we're saying is, is God has it under control, I am not my work. I am what God says about me. I am what the liberating Jesus does for me. So many of us were slaves to our work, but also we're slaves to our work in a different way. We're slaves to our work in trying to prove our belovedness. That many of us every day wake up and we don't feel very valuable in the world because of whatever happened, because of what our record says, because of what our dad said to us as a kid, because of the way our, our, our parents abandoned, whatever it is. We try to work to prove our belovedness. We try to work to prove our belovedness to God. Okay, God, like, I know I really messed up last week, like, but if I do this and this and this, then I will be, lo- be more beloved. We become a slave to our work trying to prove our belovedness to God. Or we become a slave to our work trying to prove our belovedness to our friends and family, the people around us. We do things that we think will make them love us more. We become slaves to ourselves trying to prove to ourselves that we are more beloved. This is a way that we become a slave to our work. But Jesus here is saying, listen, when he was quoting the passage in Deuteronomy, he's saying, listen, 
You were a slave to working. But remember, on the Sabbath day, we're creating the sacred place for you to reach out your hand and remember the liberating God. The God that says you don't have to work to prove your belovedness. You've been beloved the whole time. The God that says you don't need to work to prove your worth to the people around you. You have an identity in me. You already are as beloved as you ever have been. You are so deeply beloved you don't even understand it. But you're so loud at trying to work to prove your belovedness that you can't even listen to me whispering, I love you. And so we become so busy, and so what the Sabbath is, is it's saying, listen, I no longer am subjecting myself to the law. I'm never going to worship the law any longer. I'm going to set aside a day, not just a day off, but I'm going to set aside to, for, to be in a sanctuary of time where I can be rested and rejuvenated and healed by my liberator, where I can pray and talk to God, where I can have communion with my friends and family in a meal. Our spirituality is not about following a rule. It's about reaching out to Jesus for our liberation and healing. Our healing is not about doing. Some of you are in grief right now. You're saying, if I just do the few more things, then I'll be delivered from my grief. Some of you are in addiction. Some of you brought your drugs here last week and you already relapsed. And you said, well, if I could have just got to five more days. It's not about doing. It's about reaching out to Jesus and letting his love lead the way. And so where, where in our hearts, in our minds, are we convicted about the work, the ways in which we're trying to prove our belovedness to our friends, to ourselves, to God? Where in our daily work are we trying to, to establish an identity? Perhaps one of those things about the, the, the religious spirit stuck out to you. Are we quick to dismiss people's feelings? Are we always trying to accuse? What are we a slave to today that we simply need to not do anything but just reach out our hand and let God take it? To just let God take it. You've been trying so hard. Why are you so tired? Why are you out of gas? Because you've been working too hard. You've been working too much on things that God says, you don't need to work at that. You don't need to prove your belovedness to anybody. No wonder you're out of gas. You've been driving on roads that you don't belong on. And he's saying, listen... Give that up. Reach out to me. We don't need this, this religious heart anymore. We don't need to go around accusing people so they know how smart about the Bible we are. We don't need to make sure that things look right before somebody gets healed. Just pray for them. Just It starts with love. And this is what Jesus was showing us. So may it be, my friends and family, that we liberate ourselves from the oppression of the law and we reach out and receive the love that only God can give. Thanks for tuning in to a message from The Sanctuary Church. For more information and media, go to our website at thesanctuarywestside.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube.